Thank you all. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to join the conference. But even more, I appreciate the initiative that you all have taken to have a conference on this topic here at Columbia University. Uh, it's good to see scholars and practitioners and persons from the region engaging in a discourse. I hope that as a result of this conference, there are some practical ideas that emerge about how we can further institutionalize the study of Kurdish issues here at Columbia University. Uh, this is an effort that I would wholly endorse and hope to be able to support. So I am grateful for your invitation. It comes at a rather timely moment for me because in a couple of days I'll be leaving for Turkey and Iraqi Kurdistan. One could argue that had I just returned, my information might have been more current, but having visited Turkey many dozens of times and worked on Kurdish issues over 25 years, I'll try to draw from my own historical memory and share some impressions about where we are with the peace process in Turkey and make some specific and concrete recommendations about what needs to be done in order to consolidate recent steps and move forward with a sustainable peace. It's not news to anybody here that the March announcements by the government of Turkey and the PKK to establish a ceasefire and a withdrawal of forces represents a very significant step forward in efforts to end what has been a tragic conflict over many decades that has taken tens of thousands of lives. We also know that this isn't the first time that Turkey and the PKK have agreed to a ceasefire. And while we're very hopeful that this agreement will set the stage for a just and lasting solution, we have to be steely-eyed about where we are in this process and why this moment is different than other moments. Professor Morton George here at Columbia has written extensively about the theory of rightness. This is a belief that conflicts and when the warring parties become tired of bloodshed and human suffering. And there is a kind of organic process in any conflict that brings the parties to this moment of rightness, but there are also external factors that help to precipitate that. And though I am a scholar of Kurdish studies, I'm also an activist and have both a UN and government background, so I'm a big believer in trying to precipitate that moment of rightness. And to always recognize that these discussions are largely influenced by domestic politics and the political environment in which they occur. So why is this moment different? Uh, it comes at a time where Turkey's Prime Minister Erdogan is embarking on a negotiation to solidify constitutional reform. Constitutional reform that will establish a strong executive presidency and presumably an office that he can occupy so that in the future he can continue to provide political leadership in Turkey. It also comes at a moment when Abdullah Öcalan has embraced democratic and cultural rights in lieu of armed struggle. And though we're not privy to the discussions that happened on Imrali leading up to the announcement in March, my political instincts tell me that there has been some dialogue about the BDP votes for the new constitution in exchange for meaningful constitutional reform, establishing political and cultural rights of Kurds, and further solidifying economic opportunities. It's also important to put this in a global perspective, because Turkey isn't the first country that's embarked on this kind of post-conflict peace building process. I myself have worked in half a dozen countries in the Balkans and the Caucasus, recently in Burma, 
in Sri Lanka, in Sudan, studying and working hands-on as a practitioner in peace processes and reconciliation efforts. So I'd like to highlight three key elements which from my experience need to be incorporated into the next phase of negotiations for this very promising start to reach a fulfilling and sustainable conclusion. And those remarks are addressed in the categories of disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, amnesty arrangements, and truth-telling and reconciliation processes. I'll try to make available to you a longer paper on each of these subjects, but for the purposes of our brief discussion today, I just want to highlight in those three areas several of the key elements that need to be incorporated so that we can translate the goodwill which currently exists into good negotiations resulting in a satisfactory outcome. Let me start with some definitions. When we use the term disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, which is commonly referred to as DDR, what we mean is a process that contributes to security and stability in post-conflict recovery by removing weapons from the hands of combatants, taking the combatants out of military structures, and helping them integrate socially and economically into society and finding livelihoods. This is a process that is not only applied to guerrilla groups, but also to state-sponsored militias. The ultimate goal of DDR is to transform ex-combatants so they can become stakeholders in peace. What we've seen evolving since the 1980s is DDR is a standard feature of peace agreements in all different post-conflict peace environments. During this time, there have been 34 DDR programs created between 1994 and 2005. By 2007, there were over a million former combatants participating in DDR projects in over 19 countries. A billion and a half dollars was being spent at an average of $1,400 per ex-combatant. There are a lot of different examples of how this has worked in different settings. Colombia is one where we see the disarmament of almost 32,000 ex-paramilitaries who were sponsored by the state and 21,000 former guerrilla groups members of guerrilla groups. We see some parallelism between the DDR, the state-sponsored organization, and those who are fighting for their basic political and human rights. This is not a short-term strategy. DDR needs to be embedded in long-term goals, and it needs to be incorporated into a comprehensive strategy for peace building and reconstruction. And this strategy has to include a variety of different elements, including security sector reform, political and justice reform, transitional justice measures, and socioeconomic development. It's not just about guns and camps and counting the number of weapons that are put in cantons. It's about transforming a society from a culture of violence and creating conditions so that social and economic and political conditions are ripe for peace to be achieved and sustained. When we think about DDR, they're often closely linked to different amnesty arrangements. And you can't really disassociate one from the other. In the case of Turkey, there are more than a hundred senior commanders of the PKK who have received red cards. It might be easy to deal with some of the lower level rank and file members of the PKK, but these senior commanders can also act as spoilers. 
They can discourage those newer recruits from engaging in a DDR process. So when we think about amnesty, we need to think about a comprehensive amnesty program that looks at participants at all different levels of a command structure, considers when they join in an armed struggle, and develops conditions for amnesty that correspond differently to when and how they became engaged. The definition of amnesty essentially revolves around the provision of forgiveness measures as a positive tool for peace building and resolution. It's an act of forgiveness over past acts. They're usually granted by a government to specific persons or classes of persons who are guilty of a crime or a political offense and then condition upon their obedience to state authority. They're a legal measure adopted in exceptional circumstances, either through executive order or through the parliament. The ultimate objective is to create an environment so that persons who are involved in armed struggle feel as though they have legal protection to abandon their armed conflict and re-enter society as constructive members. Of course, the manner in which a conflict ends has a lot to do with how amnesties are defined. If you have one side which is entirely vanquished, then usually the victor is able to impose an amnesty regime on them. If there's an ongoing struggle, then the terms of an amnesty have to be negotiated, usually between the government and those persons who have been involved in an armed struggle over a long period of time. The terms of amnesty are usually incorporated into peace accords and later into national legislation. And they're always linked to a DDR process. So you can't compartmentalize DDR from amnesty. There may be a view in anchor that you can just focus on economic issues, but unless you're dealing with the core political grievances and the amnesty requirements of all levels of the organization, you're really not going to be able to move forward in a constructive way. It's also important to note that in lieu of amnesty, there are a number of examples where individuals are allowed to seek asylum in third countries. When we think about what to do with senior PKK commanders, many of them are currently based in Iraq. Iraq's president, Jalal Talabani, has spoken favorably towards providing asylum to them. So there may in fact be a surrogate to amnesty that allows them to seek asylum. There are a whole range of different amnesty requirements. There are amnesty arrangements. I could go through some 500 of them, but let me just characterize them in a typology. Uh, some amnesty deals are given in post-conflict context, Croatia in 1996. Other than non-conflict context, Spain, 1977. Some focus on past injustices, Morocco, 1994. Others look to entrenched impunity, Chile, 1978. Some specifically cover acts of violence, Algeria, 2005. Some appear in constitutions, Ghana, 1992, and others in legislation, Guatemala, 1996, and some through executive decree, Greece of 1974. Some deal only with state agents, as we saw in Turkey in 1982, and others to non-state components, Colombia 2003. Some to both, Sierra Leone 1999. Some are sweeping, Angola of 99, and others are more circumscribed. Ivory Coast 2002. There's a great deal of research that's been done looking at more than 500 different amnesty arrangements. There's a lot of international experience that's available. It would behoove the parties in Turkey to study some of that international experience. We have access to some of that data. We'll be very pleased to make it available to you and your colleagues. When we speak about amnesty, we have to also think about for whom are we discussing amnesty? 
whom are we targeting? Amnesty should address the categories of crimes that are committed, the categories of persons covered by the amnesty, and the legal consequences for each potential beneficiary. Of course, there's an inherent tension that exists between amnesties and the DER process and the goal of accountability, which is central to any transitional justice program. And some critics of amnesty view it as a source of impunity that compromises transitional justice by removing the possibility of criminal accountability. Each situation is different. Each culture has its own perspective. How you achieve a balance between amnesty and accountability is something that has to be understood based on a moment in time and the geography to be covered. Amnesties are just but one issue within a much broader context that involve very difficult and important bargains having to do with peace, justice, and power. And when we think about those elements, of course, we have to recall the importance of a truth and reconciliation process. Truth and reconciliation occurs within the broader context of dealing with conflict or a significant social trauma caused by war, crimes against humanity, or genocide. It's part of the transitional justice strategy. It allows countries to move from a period of tragedy to a period of peace building. I want to just talk very briefly about the concept of truth, because as the truth-telling experience evolved, mostly in Argentina and countries of Latin America, truth was a significant victim of regimes that tried to cover up the crimes that had been committed. This importance of truth was highlighted by a resolution of the UN Human Rights Commission in 2005, this right to truth resolution obligated the state to investigate human rights violations, inform individuals of the fate of missing persons or those who were forcibly displaced, provide information to their family members or mortal remains, and also, very significantly, to disclose the identity of the violators. If somebody committed a crime and they are individually responsible, it was required to identify the individual who committed the crime so there could be some mechanism for dealing with them in a broader context of societal healing. Truth became expressed in different ways, as voice and as evidence. It was important as this process evolved in Latin America to allow testimonials of persons who were victimized, to tell the story in their own words, so this wasn't just an abstract concept, but a compelling personal tale of individual suffering that could animate the society as a whole. And to this end, a number of countries created forums where testimonials could be heard. And these settings maximized their emotional impact and their potential for societal healing. When we look back to Argentina's transition to democracy in 1983, there have been dozens of truth commissions that were established around the world. These were done to examine past abuses, to consider those abuses usually over a specific period of time. Each truth commission has a charter identifying its mandate, when that mandate begins and when it concludes, or if there's a particular event, talked about there since before, identifying in its terms of reference the scope of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They are almost always essentially victim-centered. The purpose of having a TRC is to give redress to victims so that their stories are told and so what happened to them can be addressed within a broader transitional justice strategy. As this work has evolved, we increasingly came to question whether or not truth and reconciliation necessarily go together. In fact, we see a number of instances where, tr where truth commissions don't even incorporate the term reconciliation into their charter. 
a historical clarification commission in Guatemala, for example, deliberately steered away from the idea of reconciliation. So did the Paraguay Truth and Justice Commission. It wasn't until 1990 that Chile established the world's first Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What we saw as an innovation in this field in 1995 in South Africa, which adopted the Promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act, was a new twist on this idea of truth-telling. What South Africa's Truth Commission did is it gave voice not only to the victim, it also called upon the perpetrator of crimes to come forward, and it offered amnesty to those who had committed sometimes the most heinous crimes in exchange for standing before the victims' families and society and just explaining what had happened and what their individual roles had been. Of course, this created some controversy. It had the moral endorsement of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, but for those who lost La Fonte, I know the family of Stephen Biko personally objected to the idea that guilt could somehow be absolved simply through the acts of truth telling. So there are a whole range of different issues, a whole range of different technical considerations. When we design a truth and reconciliation commission, a truth telling process, there are criteria that we always need to consider. The headlines of those criteria involve objectives, authority, functions, competence, powers, composition, credibility, and finance. And of course, how we elaborate the specifics of any kind of truth-telling mechanism or a truth and reconciliation mechanism depends upon the needs of the individuals and the society as a whole. So I submit to you this afternoon that these three categories need to be incorporated into Turkey's way forward. That the goodwill that exists now is a very significant step forward. But it's going to take time to consolidate this progress. If we're talking about constitutional reform to ensure greater political and cultural rights, constitutions aren't drafted overnight. How many, for how many years have we heard talk about Turkey's new civil constitution? At a minimum, we're going to be looking at 9 to 12 months before there's a new constitution. And it's very easy for momentum to go awry, for the parties to lose confidence. And given the history of injustice that has been committed by the state against the Kurds of Turkey, it's entirely likely that without some interim steps demonstrating genuine commitment that this process of building on goodwill and working towards sustainable peace could run off the rails. So if the government of Turkey is serious and sincere, it needs to do some things in the short term. Ultimately, this process is not going to be judged by what politicians say. It will be judged by what politicians do. And if we wait 9 or 12 months for those actions, my concern is it will never get to the point where we are negotiating the details of the Constitution, where the government and the PKK are sitting at a table together talking about DDR, looking at amnesty terms, and designing a truth-telling mechanism. So I think that the government of Turkey needs to show its sincerity. And the way to do that is to take some immediate steps well within its mandate and its parliamentary majority. From my view, if Prime Minister Erdogan is serious about peace, he needs to implement statutory reforms in the short term to show that Turkey is indeed becoming more democratic and that regressive legislation that has been used to silence freedom of expression is revoked, not amended. So Article 8 of the Anti-Terror Act Article 301 of the Penal Code that makes it a crime to denigrate Turkishness. These should just go. They are part of an era which has passed. 
If Ankara is serious about moving forward, it should immediately submit to the Parliament legislation to withdraw its regressive laws that are used to crack down on human rights. And if it does do that, then I have very high hopes that this process will continue with its momentum, that there will be goodwill on both sides. There's an important role for international actors here, and having worked with the U.S. government, the Obama administration needs to stay fully engaged. It needs to be working with both parties. The European Union needs to have a carrot and sticks approach. There's clearly a role for the international actors, and I would be remiss if I didn't include in my remarks a word of commendation to the Kurdistan regional government, because its very constructive role in this process has brought us to where we are today. Brought us to this historic moment in time, brought us to a, a, a period when we can look to the future and with confidence believe that that future is beckoningly bright and that peace is at hand. And to this goal, we at our peace building program stand committed. If Colombia is able to set up a chair in Kurdish studies, it would be a great environment to dig deeper into these issues and make sure that peace is not a moment, but peace is a process that is enduring. And I thank you all for your attention. I wanted to ask about those who are opposing when the state and non state actors are interacting with the village guard and how um, DDR can work and, and these processes can work for these groups who are sometimes perpetrators, sometimes victims in this wider process, um, sometimes have exasperated the conflict for their own personal gain to sort of invent um, invent conflict or you know accuse others of, of inventing conflict, for example, um, so that their position in a war-torn region where they have no other employment can be continued so that they can continue receiving arms and salaries and so So there are always reasons why conflicts continue. There are interests, and usually they're financial interests. And clearly, there's been a lot of human suffering in Turkey's conflict areas. There's also been a lot of material gain. And I would put the village guard in a category of persons who have gained materially from the conflict. They also need to be incorporated into a GDR process. And since their livelihoods have been linked to being agents of the conflict, their future livelihoods have to be linked to becoming agents of peace. There are good examples of that in Colombia. That's why studying how other countries have dealt with it can be illustrative and not prescriptive. It needs to be adapted to each individual circumstance. The village guards have their own unique requirements. DVR, sequencing, can it be altered? It can be altered. And my own view is that uh, if you have a linear sequencing, you have a design to alter. Because in fact, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration are parallel tracks. They can be conceptualized together as a sequence of events, but when you get around to negotiating and implementing them, they all need to be proceeding together. You, you need two feet to walk. If you rely on full disarmament before you demobilize, you may never get to that point. So you need to have a carefully calibrated, synchronized strategy. So I ask a competitive question about DDR. Uh, were there any DDRs in which there was a regional conflict in which Let's say, for example, um, the um, armed forces in one country would be re-instrumentalized in a regional conflict again. Because that's from the beginning of this sort of peace process, we also heard that you know some of the PKK members can be either taken out of the border or could be maybe used elsewhere in other sort of conflicts. So, was there any um, you know similar? situations in the DDR that you may have come across? Uh, there are a number of instances where conflicts have cross-border dimensions to them. Usually, the armed group 
which is engaged in cross-border activities, is doing that without the sanction of the host government and the country from which they are operating. But if you were to look at the 34 case studies of DDR, you probably would find some where the host government was actually an agent providing financing and weapons and other kinds of training to support the armed insurgency. So here again, I would refer us to a research agenda. It would be a good topic for a Kurdish studies chair. How have cross-border activities affected DDR activities in other settings? And also when we talk about amnesty, you know, we do run the risk of giving amnesty to persons who might use it as an opportunity to reload and then relaunch operations. So are there examples of that? And if so, how do we work to prevent that from happening? But what if, what if the regional balance is such that the use of them is something good, so to speak? So um, good, is, good is an objective criteria. I know. I know. And I'm sure that we all would define the good in different terms. I think that if we were to find a common denominator about the good, we would say it involves democracy, individual rights, group rights, and prosperity. And that's the rising tide of this all this. I come from DC, I'm from VOA Kurdish, I wrote up English. You mentioned about Obama administration and US government. Uh, where does U.S. government stand in this process in Turkey, and what can U.S. government do, public, especially Kurds? Really have a big question mark on, mind, on their mind. Where does administration stand? Uh, what can the administration do more actively? Official working on this yeah, issue, so course, I right. can't uh, speak with authority on that matter. But I do know that U.S. policy has always been to support democracy and development as the twin pillars to a lasting solution of uh, the conflict in Turkey with its Kurds. And I don't think that that has changed. I think where it gets slightly more nuanced is the role of the Kurdistan regional government. So thank you all.